on your own spiritual journey, you are welcome here to join other fellow travelers at Hatfield Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. So, um, Anthony has already played a couple of hymns, and uh, yesterday he played a lot. Uh, we had a wedding, and the poor bridal party, they're down in Northampton waiting to get picked up by a limousine service to come up here to church for 3 o'clock. The limousine couldn't find them. So after staying for a while, the limousine driver started to head back to Holyoke. So then they kind of realized, got a call of Holyoke to find out what's going on. They got an answering service, so they couldn't talk to the limo driver. So what happened is the church service for the wedding started 45 minutes late because the bridal party could not get here without the limousine. And this guy right here played for 45, well, no, you started beforehand. So he started before, and then he played until the 45-minute the late wedding. So, yeah, he's a little bit tired today. I'm a little bit enthusiastic today because I have become a huge Houston Astros fan. I love the Houston Astros. They are my favorite team right now, and so I'm all enthused by them. So he's tired, but I'm enthused. So we're going to even out somewhere in between. Let's now <laughs> let's turn to our call to worship, please. We gather to honor our covenant with God and with each other. In our worship, the ties that bind us together, they grow stronger. Let us open our eyes to meet God face to face. Let us open our ears to hear his voice. Come to touch the reality of Christ's presence here. Feel his spirit weaving us together into an extraordinary community. Praise be to God. Amen. And now we come together in our unison prayer. Sow your seed in our midst, O Lord, for we are prepared to receive what you offer. We want to know you and to bear fruit worthy of your reign among us. We want to meditate on your law and keep your commandments. Draw us into the new covenant you have fashioned for us in Jesus Christ, your Son so that we may fulfill our ministry as Christians. Give us the confidence to preach fearlessly, but not to resort to cliches of judgment and fear, for Christ's gospel and example are far more compelling and honest. Amen. All right, so our opening hymn. Last week we did our first try at this, and you know we weren't all that good last week, so this week we're going to try again. We're not going to have one of these psalms every Sunday, but let's get into the, into, uh, the familiarity of it so we can pull one out on occasion. And the choir this time is here to lead us. So please open up to page 760 in the blue hymnal, psalm number 121. Um, Anthony will give us the line, the choir, and, and we can sing that line. And then I will do the regular uh, print face uh, psalm, and then you will come in where it's bold face. Then back to me, the regular face pr uh, print, bold face is you, and then we sing the uh, response up here again, and we just continue like that for Psalm 121. <laughs> My eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Right, we 
did beautiful that time. Thank you. So it's now time to pass our gift of peace with one another. Our young people, please come forward. All right. We got enough. I can actually have a seat with you guys today. All right. Sometimes there's not enough room for me up here, but today we can all sit together. Come on, where do you want to go? Where are you going to go? Here? What? You're going to go here? Okay. What you you want to you go right there? All right. So anyway... These flowers right here are from yesterday's wedding. It, wedding. You know, you know what a wedding is, right, everybody? Yeah. yeah. yeah that, my, 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 grandma, my, my uncle. Well, what about your mom and your dad? They're married, right? They don't do that kissing stuff, do they? Yeah. 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 Well, they kiss. They. Oh no, they were. They were kissing right there, right in front of God's altar. They were smooching. It was yuck. So anyway. We had these, these flowers are here from that wedding yesterday. And during the wedding, I told them a, a chicken. What was that? A chicken. A chicken? Yeah. Weddings and chickens? Yeah. Okay, you just sit here. That's a good point. <laughs> so we had the wedding, and we told the story about Adam and Eve. Do you know the Adam and Eve story, anybody? First one, the first guy in the garden of Eden, and then, and then his wife, Eden. Uh, Eden. His wife, Eden. So I told that story yesterday, and then I told a little joke about it. I'm not going to tell you the joke, because I don't think you get the joke. But any, and I don't want to wind anybody up. But anyway, that Adam and Eve story, Adam, the first guy, and then not, no, no, and then Eve, the first woman. So, help me. Barbara, help me. Okay, so we just got to calm down for one sec, one sec. So anyway, Adam and Eve, there, where am I going? <laughs> oh yeah, Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, they were the first man, the first woman. And so they're like married together. But then they, they, they eat the wrong fruit. And God said, don't eat that fruit. And they did, and they were thrown out of the, uh, the garden. And forever after that, but after that, what happened is people started to say that because they sinned, all of us are sinners. So they sin way, way, way back. And because they did a sin way, way, way back, they're saying that we're sinners too. Have you ever been blamed for something that you didn't do? No. no. Yes? yes? Have you? Anybody else been blamed for something they didn't? I'll, I'll sleep a lot of time. Okay. I kind of figured you would have been. So, <laughs> so I was a little kid, probably about your ages, and I remember going to my grandmother's house and I told, I showed my grandmother, look, somebody drew on your wall. My grandmother spanked my rear end because she thought I was the one who drew on the wall when all I said was, look, grandma, someone drew on your wall. I'm now 59 years old. I still remember getting spanked for something I didn't do. It did not sit well. Oh, what? I used to get spanked on the door. Well, yeah, I did. A lot of times. A lot of times? All right, okay. So. 
So what Adam and Eve did is they did something bad, and now we're still getting in trouble for it, and it doesn't feel right. And so when you guys are in Sunday school, we're going to be talking about this prophet Jeremiah. And hold on, wait, wait, wait. And Jeremiah says, Jeremiah says, you're only responsible for what you do. God is fair. God does not hold you responsible for something somebody else does. God only cares what you do. So we have a fair God, and we have to try to be good so that fair God can be, we can honor that fair God. Okay? Okay, guys. Off to Sunday school, okay? All right. See you guys later. He's right there. Oh my gosh. Okay. Bye, Barb. Okay. taped two of his hands and then he played the other two on top of that so that was a four-hand piece played by one organist over here so that was pretty cool <laughs> time for our joys our celebrations and our concerns uh, we begin with two private intentions offered for health and recovery for members here we also continue to offer our prayers for ed mccarthy who is back with us this sunday we continue to pray for charlie kellogg a friend of this church 
pray for uh, Doug Bilecki, a friend of mine battling cancer. We offer still our prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner of this church and prayers for Muriel Kilbovich as well. And we also continue to offer our prayers for Lynn Omasta as she is treated for her cancer. Any other joys, celebrations, concerns you'd like to offer? Marsha. I think Maggie deserves a day <laughs> I don't know what they ever learned from that though. So we got <laughs> <laughs> yes. again too because last week you mentioned um, we have a hundred and what first birthday coming up that you'd like to offer, joy, celebrations, anything like that. All right, let's just turn a little bit inward now uh, to say the things to Jesus that we can't say out loud and also to listen for his word. Just, righteous, and listening Savior, ever more ready to hear us than we are to pray to you, meet us where we are, lest we decide that you are beyond our reach. We bring our disappointments and complaints, our cries for justice, our concerns for those in need, asking for strength and courage to join in a more effective ministry among all your people, whomever they may be. We also share with you our joys and our thanksgivings, because we know that you have given us the opportunity to make this life beautiful. You are always but a prayer away. And in that sense of God only being a prayer away, let us now come together and say in the words that Jesus himself gave us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we do not lose heart amidst all the problems and scandals that would steal our attention away from the good and the holy that are still present in our world. We have the spiritual material resources needed to make a difference through our work as church, and for the things we talk about as stewardship campaign is in progress, and also the persistent work of evangelism, 
teaching and our charity. What we dedicate here is a part of our larger commitment of time and talents to the work of Christ's continuing ministry that takes place through us. May we therefore be as generous as our faith expects and as our situation in life allows. offerings now to be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. We will hear the ancient words of the prophet Jeremiah when he reveals that God will no longer be in our relationship only through commandments, that he will be known to us, he will be intimate, we will be heart to heart, soul to soul. We will become God's people at that time. This generosity, this giving to causes that we may not even know their benefit, that is a sign of our love and our trust in God. It is a sign that God in us are one at this moment. We thank you for your generosity and we pray that God may use these gifts to the cause of bettering this world and making it his reign. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now we have a chance to sing once again. And this time it is the Reflecting Hymn, Blue Hymnal, number 494. We ran out of time last Sunday, so no, we are Christians.
as Reverend Cowell told you, we're reading from Jeremiah this morning. If you'd like to join me, it's on page 642 in the Pew Bible. Jeremiah 31, 27 through 34. Individual retribution. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall, be, they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge, but all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. A new covenant. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one, shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And the reading, the gospel reading for today, is taken from Luke's gospel, and it is going to be from chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. And Jesus said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for the people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while the judge refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? May the words of our mouths, or my mouth, and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Fall is absolutely my favorite season. And probably one of the greatest gifts of this time of the year is all of the colors. Whether you like uh, fall or not, the colors are absolutely amazing. At my flagship store job, I see all these people coming from literally all over the country to be here in New England during the fall because it is just so beautiful here. And, you know, those trees, as I'm out there like walking my dog or something, I look up at the trees, you know, it kind of, it just, it just fills you with a good feeling, but then... You know, I like the, the leaves and the, the, the ground as you're walking, you know, the, the smell of them, the look of them, you know, just the feel of them. But those are the dead or dying leaves. And I wonder how those leaves still on the tree, how do they stay fresh and vibrant throughout the growing season? How come they're not always dead? How does that tree get that leaf that's way up at the top of the tree? How does it push the water that high up? So those leaves can be green throughout the summer, even when it's so dry. And so, you know, even like the, the redwoods, I heard those are 380 feet tall. How in the world does that tree have the energy to push that water up so that that redwood tree, that up there at 380 feet, that that is still alive? A number of years ago, a lot of years ago, I took a tour of the power plant at Northfield Mountain. And you can go, they have them all the time. And if you, if you ever have a chance, go. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And so 
that power station, what they do is they push water up to a mountaintop reservoir. And they do that at night when power is less expensive. So they push all this water to the top of this mountaintop reservoir. And then during the day, especially at peak hours when it's harder to generate energy, they open up the gates and they let that reservoir at the top come flooding back down because gravity takes no energy. And it brings that water back down and it turns the turbines. Now this only makes sense economically. You know, the physics behind it requires a lot more energy to get the water up there than they're ever going to get by the water coming back down and turning those turbines. It's just like bouncing a ball. You can bounce it as hard as you want, but each successive bounce is going to be a little bit you know, lower until it finally doesn't bounce at all. So that's the same thing of pushing all that water up to the top and coming down later when it's more expensive. So that's only sensible economically. It doesn't make sense for physics. So how is it that a tree pumps all that water from its deepest roots up to that uppermost leaf, maybe even 380 feet up into the sky. So just looking at my maple tree in the backyard makes me wonder, and the same makes me wonder as I think about the redwoods. Well, people who know a lot more than I, they say that the roots can only push the water up about 20 feet. And that's not going to get you very far with a tree. So what about like the redwood? Where does that other 360 feet, how does that get up to the top? So experts will tell you that it's not from pushing from below, it's from pulling from above. The water is pulled up, not pushed from below. So water evaporates from the leaves, and as it does, it leaves a little gap. Where it once was and it goes off into the atmosphere, now there's a little gap. And water molecules have a real strong bond to each other. Like if you ever see on a flat wooden surface, you see the little like, you know, bubbles of water. That's because the water bonds together even stronger, at least at the small scales, and gravity can try to flatten it out. So water wants to glob together with other water. So when one of those molecules evaporates into the atmosphere, it pulls up one of the water molecules from below it. And then the one below that pulls another one up. And so it's these water molecules that are already in the system pulling that water up instead of pushing. It's pulling it up. And I ask you to keep this whole process in mind as we now turn to Jesus' parable of the persistent widow and the unjust judge. That idea that you only push so far, but from above you can keep pulling. So I sense a bit of tension in this parable or at least the way that this parable can be heard, because I don't want people to think that our prayers to God have to become a nuisance, that we have to nag God into getting what we want, because you can hear that in the message. The, the widow just pesters the judge until the judge finally grants what she wants, and we don't want to say the same thing about God. We don't want to pester God with our prayers, and I don't know if you guys ever checked the website, but once in a while I'll put these daily devotionals that are uh, sent throughout the UCC. And today's daily devotional is actually that message. The, 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 the pastor is saying that we pester God with our prayers. And it's like saying, please. And I don't get that message. And it's not pestering God when we say the Lord's Prayer, when we just turn inward for a few moments before and just really kind of speak to God from our souls. We don't want to think of that as pestering God. And the other thing is, we don't want to become so self-righteous that we think we can push people to God. There's a great difference. There's a huge divide between righteousness and self-righteousness. A self-righteous person can actually push people away from God more than they can push a person towards God. And so we've got to be very careful about what this example of this pestering woman seeking justice from an unjust judge is all about. Badgering is like pushing. It doesn't get you far. And religious badgering is just an annoyance. But persistence, I think that's Jesus' message. Persistence is different. Let me try to explain. Jesus' intent with today's parable, I think, is clear, even with all that, that kind of camouflage of the pestering. The woman was wrong. The judge is corrupt. Her only avenue to right this wrong is persistent. She has to keep going to him. And because of his own self-care, he says, i got to get rid of this woman, so I'll grant her what she wants. So persistence answers her prayer. Injustice was a daily reality for this poor woman. Just like anybody who is poor in the world, even today, they face injustice constantly. So it's not something only from a long ago, it's something today as well. And Jesus takes this lived reality, and as its contrast, he gives us the nature of God. 
God is the opposite of the unjust judge. Therefore, there is no need to pester God. The woman in the parable gets justice because she wears the judge down. But Jesus says in contrast, will God delay long in helping? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice. So the crowds of people listening to Jesus were all too familiar with injustice because people in power did not care about them. Jesus tells them of a different power. Jesus tells them that their prayers matter to God. It's not about nagging God. God cares when we turn to him. So persistence isn't about getting God's justice because God is just by his very nature. But still, Jesus says, hang in there with your prayers. Keep saying those prayers like we do for some of those people who have been on our list for weeks after week, month after month. We keep saying those prayers, not because God doesn't hear the first time. Jesus says be persistent. So why do we need to be persistent if it's not about nagging God? If God already grants us justice quickly, why do we still have to keep saying those same prayers week after week after week? Why do we still say the same silent prayers week after week after week? not to nag God into doing what we think is best. It's not about the more we pray, the more we get. Persistence instead, says Jesus, means being conscious, aware, and appreciative that we are constantly in the presence of God and that God is constantly present for us. It's not about getting what we want. It's about communion with God. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he falls on his face in utter despair, beseeching God, if it be possible, Lord, take this cup away from me. Three times Jesus says that to God with absolute confidence that God hears his prayer the next day he dies on the cross. So persistence in prayer, sincerity in prayer, is not always about getting what we want. It's about being there with God and knowing that God is there with us. Maureen read for us from the prophet Jeremiah, and I, I love the prophet Jeremiah. I think he may be my favorite prophet. If not him, then Amos. And it was a transformative moment in Israel's history. They were transitioning from a time when they had a beautiful temple, they had a powerful king, and everybody thought that this is God's kingdom, this is where God rests in the temple, and all of a sudden in Jeremiah's time this was all being taken away. The people were going to be dispersed. The people would have no king, the people would have no temple. And so at that point, Jeremiah reveals God's words, and he says of God, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No longer shall they have to teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. It's not going to be about a minister or anybody else telling you this is what God says. It's not only going to be from reading the Bible that says this is what God says. It's going to be God speaking to each of us and that we each know God. That is an intimacy that we are still striving for. And Jeremiah says that can be what we have in our life. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That constancy brings us to God so that we and God become of one. In the best sense of the word, we become a godly people. Now, it would be great if Jesus' words ended at that point, that we have the potential to be a godly people, but there's that question, that vague, worrisome question that Jesus finishes his story with. Jesus actually finishes by asking, God will be there, but will anybody be turning to God in the future? When the Son of Man returns, will there be anyone who is still faithful? God says Jesus is the polar opposite of the unjust judge. God does care. He cares about us. But will people continue to care about God? So I just put up on our Facebook page, maybe Thursday or Friday, something like that, the Pew Research Center just released a new study. And it goes across the country, across denominations. And I think you know the, the message that um, the Pew found is that Christianity is dropping all across the board, all across denominations, all across the country, even the Southern Bible Belt. It just does not feel authentic to a lot of people anymore, and they are leaving. They're leaving the faith. And they're leaving because a lot of people say they just don't think that the institution anymore represents the faith. Um, I don't know if you remember or not, remember Bernard Law, the Cardinal? Um, the Cardinal had come out, the Globe had just, you know, revealed all of the atrocities that were taking place in the church and were being sanctioned by the church, allowed by the church. And Bernard Law says, I hope that God's, you know, judgment comes down, especially on the Globe. 
You know, he wanted the globe to be punished for saying the things that he, they brought out into the open when the real sin was the institution. A lot of people are offended by churches now because churches seem to be becoming partisan. Um, you know, this, this denomination favors this candidate. This, this, this party is favored by this church. And people don't want churches to be political. And so they're leaving churches. A lot of churches have to only talk about money, and we do talk about money. We have a stewardship campaign, but sometimes you go into church and all you hear is about money, 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 and people are leaving churches because they don't think that churches are authentic. And when it gets to a real severe point, says the Pew Research Numbers and what Jesus says in that prophet, the other story about the tree is that that, that flow of water, that pulling up of the water, if that channel ever breaks, so that there's just a little gap in it, it can never be started again. The water above, that molecule above, is not strong enough to pull the water below, even if there's a little gap. If that flow stops for one minute, then that tree is gonna die because there's just no way to pull it forward. If the Pew Research Center is correct, and really churches across the board, across the nation are in decline, and we don't do something about it, and that little gap forms, we are the end of organized religion in the United States. There's just no way around it. The next generation will not know what organized religion is. That's how important it is for us to be faithful. You can bring the stewardship campaign to a successful completion by giving more, or you can bring the stewardship campaign to a successful completion by reaching out to someone else and saying, come with me to Hatfield Congregational Church. You really can't. It's not impossible to invite someone else to church to say, come with me. And we have to do that, people, because if that gap is for real, the church has a real possibility of dying. And I don't want to be a part of a dying church. Jesus is too important. Church is too important. You know the other messages that are out there. The message of Christ is in the church. And we have to be strong enough and brave enough to counter what is happening in our world, we have to be brave enough to pull those other people forward. Not by pushing them with, you're going to go to hell and all those other self-righteous statements, but by pulling them forward by our own example. And our own example can start by us being right here on Sundays and showing that this place, this people, what we do matters. And so may we pray in Jesus' name that we may be the people that can keep that flow going who may continue to pull forward is that gap is a real possibility and it terrifies me not only for Hatfield Congregational but for Christianity we have the chance to turn it around but it's up to us God has written his word on our hearts you don't have to be taught about God God has reached down in Jesus Christ it's up to us what are we going to do so in Jesus' name I ask you what are we going to do? Amen. So may we now uh, turn to our hymnals, red hymnal number 463, Praise, O oh Praise, Our God and King. Mm -hmm.
interested in that Pew Research or study, it is on Facebook and it is on our website. Um, it is interesting reading, even if a little bit depressing. Um, but hey, with faith, all things are possible. Let us now turn to the benediction response. Let us carry forward what we have shared in worship. We are eager to proclaim the gospel. Let us be persistent but not badgering. Let us be confident in Christ's example rather than resort to threats and fear. Let us raise our eyes and be assured of Jesus' constant help. Let us look at others and realize that they are loved by Christ just as we are. This awareness grants us life in its fullness by replacing selfishness and greed with a compassion that flows relentlessly from our faith. So let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Amen.